Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 16, The Clouds, Serious Comedy. Last time, I introduced Aristophanes as the only surviving exponent of old comedy that was contemporaneous with the later tragedies that we've looked at over the last few episodes. One of his most interesting plays is an early work that might or might not have had a significant effect on one of the greatest philosophers ever known. But there is more to the play than just a bit of interest in the life of Socrates, and it demonstrates how it was not only the theatre of tragedy that integrated with and impacted on Athenian life in the 5th century BCE. So let's take a detailed look at our first Greek comedy. In 423 BCE, Aristophanes presented what's become recognised as the first play of ideas, where the characters are really vehicles for expressing conflicting ideas and ideologies. Although the earlier plays, Acarnians and the Knights, contained elements of ideas-driven drama, the trend is much clearer in The Clouds, so it probably deserves this accolade. It's quite a loose concept and can take many forms as a subgenre, but within comedy, the development can be traced through to more recent times and seen particularly in the plays of George Bernard Shaw, where the phrase became particularly popular as a way of describing his approach, and up to the contemporary Tom Stoppard and Michael Frayn. So, let's go back to where all that started. The play opens with Strepsides waking up from a troubled sleep. These are the opening lines of the play. Great gods, will these nights never end? Will daylight never come? I heard the cock crow long ago, and my slaves are snoring still. Ah, it wasn't like this before. Curse this war. It's done me so many ills. Now I may not even chastise my own slaves. And see, here there's this lazy lad who never wakes the whole night long, but all wrapped up in his five coverlets farts away to his heart's content. Come, let me try and nestle down as well and snore too, if it's possible. Ah, hopeless. No point thinking of sleep with all these expenses. The stables, the debts, they're devouring me. Thanks to this fine cavalier, who only knows how to look after his long locks and show himself off in his chariot, and to dream of horses. And I, I'm nearly dead. When I see the moon bringing the third decade on her train and my liabilities coming due... Slave, light the lamp, bring me my tables. Now, who are my creditors? Let me see and reckon up the interest. What do I owe? Hmm. Hmm, twelve drachma to Passius. What? Twelve drachma? Why did I borrow this? Ah, I know. It was to buy that thoroughbred that cost me so much. Ha! <laughs> How I should have prized the stone that blinded him. We learn that Strepsides is under the threat of legal action because of the debts racked up by his son, Pheidippides, and all because of his expensive taste in horse racing. It's a taste encouraged by his mother, who comes from an aristocratic clan and also likes to spend money. Between them, they're draining the family coffers dry. Pheidippides sleeps on soundly nearby as his father worries, dreaming of the pleasures of horse racing. Already, we can see that familiar areas for comic conflicts are being set up across generations and genders. Strepsides wakes his son to tell him of a plan he's thought up to get them out of the financial hole. His idea is that Pheidippides will enrol in the Frontisterian, the thinkery or thinking shop. This is the philosophy school where the new art of rhetoric is taught, and most importantly, where a pupil can learn how to win any argument, regardless of its merit. With this skill, they will be able to face their creditors in court and fend them off. Streptiades thinks it's a plan that cannot fail, but Pheidippides is unconvinced and refuses to go and mingle with the effete would-be intellectuals who hang around the thinkery. Unable to persuade his son, Strepsides decides he will have to enrol in the school himself and try to shrug off his great age. At the thinkery, Strepsides hears about recent discoveries made by Socrates, who runs the school such as a new way to measure how far a flea jumps, the cause of the buzzing noise that insects make, and how a large pair of compasses can be used for stealing cloaks from pegs. 
He asks to meet the man who has all these impressive thoughts and Socrates appears from above in a basket that he uses to make astronomical and solar observations. Socrates accepts Strepsides into the school. The induction ceremony includes a parade of singing clouds and members of the school who are the chorus of the play. The action pauses for the parabasis. That pause where the chorus come out of character and speak directly to the audience. They praise Aristophanes, who, they say, has created his cleverest play, and they remind us of how brave he has been in the past, making fun of those in power. They then reproach the audience for not having appreciated the play properly when it was first presented. They then particularly mention Cleon, saying that the gods will look favourably on any punishment that is dealt to him for his corruption. The action continues, with Socrates complaining that his new student is useless. In an attempt to get him to clear his mind and allow good and meaningful thoughts to arise naturally, he covers him with a blanket, but when he checks on him, he catches him masturbating and finally gives up on him. Strepsides returns to his original plan and conjoles and threatens Pheidippides until he agrees to enrol in the thinkery. He's met by two of Socrates' assistants, right and wrong, who debate which of them can offer the young man the best education. Right offers a course of self-discipline and self-denial, while wrong suggests the best way for a life of relaxation and pleasure. This, he suggests, is the life of the city leaders who know how to talk their way out of any sort of trouble. Pheidippides chooses the education offered by wrong and is led into the thinkery, and Strepsides exits, happy to see his plans working. In a second parabasis, the chorus then demand that the play is be awarded first prize. And, if it is, they promise good weather and harvests. If not, they say they'll ruin crops and disrupt weddings. Strepsides returns to meet his son after the schooling is complete. Pheidippides is a changed man. He's become the pale intellectual that he once despised. But Strepsides believes he will now be able to fend off their creditors through this newly acquired skill of rhetoric. When the first two creditors arrive, Strepsides is so confident that he treats them with contempt and goes indoors to celebrate his son's return and good prospects. But he returns quickly, complaining that Pheidippides has given him a beating after they argued about what poetry to recite as they celebrated. He says to the chorus, That's just how he spoke to me in the house, and then he added that Simonides was a detestable poet. However, I mastered myself and for a while said nothing. Then I said to him, at least take a myrtle branch and recite a passage from Aeschylus for me. For my own part, he at once replied, I look upon Aeschylus as the first of poets, for his verses roll superbly. They're nothing but incoherence, bombast and turgity. Yet, still, I smothered my wrath and I said, then recite one of the famous pieces from your modern poets. Then, he commenced a piece in which Euripides shows, shows a brother who violates his own blood sister. Then I could no longer restrain myself and attacked him with the most injurious abuse. Naturally, he retorted, hard words were hurled on both sides, and finally he sprang at me and broke my bones, bore me to the earth, strangled and started killing me. The returned Pheidippides hears this and defends himself, using his newfound skills. He argues, Tell me. Isn't it right that in truth I should beat you for your good, since it is for a man's own best interest to be beaten? What? Must your body be free of blows and not mine? Am I not freeborn too? The children are to weep and their fathers go free? You must agree that according to the law it is the lot of children to be beaten. But... I reply that as old men are children all over again, it is far more fitting to chastise them than the young, for there is less excuse in their faults. Strepsides, caught by the argument, is incensed. He realises that he has abandoned the gods for the false god Socrates. He appeals to Hermes and orders his servant to burn down the thinkery, blaming Socrates for all his troubles. Socrates and the students run from the flames and are chased off stage by Strepsides and his followers, leaving the chorus to exit on their own. The version of the play we have is a revised one, probably incomplete, and dates from about 420 BCE, three or four years after the original production. This revised version was probably never performed in Aristophanes' lifetime. 
At its original showing, it failed to impress, coming third in competition against two plays that are now lost. As it's quite a serious by the standards of old comedy, it is suspected that that's the reason for the initial failure. The lack of personalised criticism of the political leaders in the play is probably because, at the time, Athens was looking forward to a period of peace and Aristophanes judged it not the right time to criticise the war leaders, although Cleon does not escape entirely, as I noted earlier in the first Parabasis. The satire here is focused to the corrupt state in general, the perennial struggles between the old and the new, the generational conflicts of father versus son, and against the new rational and scientific thinking that was becoming very popular. Socrates plays such a big part in the play that we have to stop here for a moment and know a little of him and Athenian philosophy. As with my summary of the Peloponnesian War previously, this is just a very brief overview of a huge subject. We are dealing with the beginnings of Western philosophy here, so I won't do it justice, but there are plenty of resources out there if you feel encouraged to delve into the subject further. With the development of democracy in Athens through the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, a need grew for education so that the demos could discuss matters properly and in detail. This was an oral process, eventually involving large gatherings of people from all walks of life. So for those who wanted to become part of the process, or control it, or use it to their advantage in any way, it became important to be able to speak well in public and to be able to argue a case. The fact that Athens became open to such discussion meant that a gap in educational need soon became noticed. Teachers from throughout the Hellenistic world came to the city. These became known as the sophists, or people of knowledge, who made a living out of educating the demos. Catching the wave of the development of democracy, they focused their teachings on questions about what was natural and what was defined by social convention or laws. You will remember the distinction as nomos versus physis from the episode on Antigone. The gathering of the sophists in one place led to more refined debating between themselves, and the concept of discussion and thinking being valuable for its own sake became acceptable, and the art of philosophy was born. Socrates was born in Athens in 470 BCE, and is both one of the most influential figures in philosophy, but also one of the most enigmatic. We don't have anything written by him, but many reports of his thinkings and sayings are recorded, via Plato, Xenophon and others. This leads to a central problem with identifying what exactly Socrates' philosophy was, as we only have it through the filter of others, and Plato in particular. It's likely that the idealised portrait Plato gives us is no more accurate than the caricature drawn by Aristophanes, and the truth lies somewhere between the two. He was born the son of a sculptor and a midwife, and tradition has it that he was trained in his father's craft. Like all Athenian men, he did military service, in his case during the Peloponnesian War between 431 and 404 BCE, where his personal courage is noted. He then served on the city council, and was part of the council that tried the generals after the Battle of Argonusi, where although the Spartan fleet was defeated, the generals were held responsible for abandoning the wounded and failing to finish off the enemy. Socrates, acting as moderator for the debate, is credited with trying to halt the executions. The physical portrait drawn is of an ugly man with a pot belly, a large face, bulging eyes and a snub nose but his character was said to be delightful. His physical features certainly made an easy target for Aristophanes, fitting with an already established stock character for comedies of old and ugly men. Illustrations on vases and elsewhere show these characters and it's easy to see how the description of Socrates fits with these and, of course, the illustrations have the addition of the prominent phallus, a constant feature of the comic plays. It's reported that the Socratic method was not to teach but to debate. He saw debate as an art form where both parties could learn. He would start a discussion with a question, taking a stance of having no knowledge about it at all. The other person would then respond, and in an atmosphere of cooperative argument, critical thinking would be generated, and the truth of the answer to the question could be agreed. In practice, this took the form of Socrates being able to persuade his opponents of the weakness of their own arguments and the correctness of his position. 
He maintained that truth was best achieved through recognising what was innately right or innately wrong, and to do that it was necessary to get reasoning from within yourself. His habit was to instigate such discussions in very public places, and he made more than a few enemies by making his opponents in the debate look foolish. He's attributed with calling Athens a sluggish horse and himself the gadfly trying to sting it into life. Unfortunately for him, humans have a habit of squashing flies. He was truly a philosopher, uh, meaning a lover of wisdom, because he didn't take payments for his teaching, as the sophists did. Indeed, he was in many ways their opposite, as he recognised that he knew very little and that learning was a never-ending process. The sophist, however, took what he knew and, in the unkindest reading, made money by splitting hairs over that knowledge for as long as possible. Socrates recognised that the most important part of philosophy was to ask the question, and that finding the answer to that had to come from a solid foundation rooted in man's ability to reason. He who knows what is good, he said, will do good meaning that if we did wrong, it was because we didn't know any better, and therefore the imperative was to continue learning so that we could make better and right judgments in the future. Socrates maintained that he did not challenge his fellow citizens just to torment them, but that he felt a divine voice urging him to do so. In 399 BC, he was accused of denying the gods and corrupting youth, and put on trial in front of a jury of 500 fellow citizens. The Athenian jury was set up with such numbers to be as incorruptible as possible, but it's difficult to imagine how unwieldy it must have been. He was found guilty by a slim majority and chose not to appeal for leniency or to take part in a jailbreak that his friends offered to organise for him, preferring to die and stay true to his conscience. He was condemned to drink hemlock, which he did in front of his friends. As the clouds was produced... His death was still many years away, and at the point where Socrates enters the play as a character, he comes in on the deus ex machina, which is representing his invention for observing the sun and the stars, but the implication that he behaves like a god is obvious. Perhaps more subtly, it also suggests that he walks on air in a dreamlike way, to not much use. Similarly, the chorus of clouds represent thought without form or substance that's needed for real-world living levelling the criticism at Socrates that all his thinking and philosophising is not helping day-to-day -day life. The satire is not only aimed directly at Socrates, but also more generally regrets the new fashion in teaching and the passing of older ways, where the emphasis for education was on physical strength, honesty and integrity in everyday life. Aristophanes seems particularly concerned about the new thinking that has emerged from the region of Ionia, current-day Turkey in the region of Izmir, that took a more scientific view, suggesting that the development of civilization was not in fact a gift from the gods, but a natural development from more primitive peoples in the past. Philosophers were also developing theories about atoms and the structure of matter, and an evidence-based approach to medicine. In the play, it's all summarised up as the scientific approach. One view is that Aristophanes is being unfair to Socrates, who becomes the embodiment of all of the different strands of new thinking. In fact, he did not run a school or make money from his philosophy, and at the very least it seems unfair of Aristophanes to lump him with the sophists, some of whom probably deserved the criticism. Socrates as a character in the play is given blasphemous things to say. He declares that Zeus does not exist and that the clouds are the real gods. His argument is a good example of the type of intellectual argument that Aristophanes finds so distasteful. He says that Zeus cannot make rain from a blue sky and that the clouds make rain, therefore Zeus does not exist. The logic is of course flawed, but that does not affect the humour of Aristophanes' point, which is that this type of logical argument is itself ridiculous. This type of logic is used successfully at the end of the play when Philoctetes turns on Strepsiades and argues for the rightness of, of a son punishing the father. It's still a satisfyingly comic scene that also questions the Socratic method of argument, showing how it could make the ridiculous seem possible. Socrates is also ridiculed as an aesthetic, someone who withdraws from the pleasures of the senses, and is an introverted thinker. 
All of these methods are part of Socratic thinking and feature in a more sympathetic light in Plato's later discourses with the philosopher. In the play, there's clearly much exaggeration. There's an interesting story that comes from the Roman author Claudius Aelianus. He was writing about 200 CE, so already hundreds of years after the event, but he was a noted Greek speaker and a fan of all things Greek. His two main works contain many references and quotes from the Greek dramatists and are considered a good source for information. But, as ever, we cannot verify the truth of his story. However, Aelianus says that Socrates was at the performance of the clouds and, on hearing some foreigners in the audience close by ask who this character was, he stood up so that everybody could see him. He showed himself as graciously amused by the ridicule. It's a nice touch and I hope it did happen. The caricature is very far from the truth, so perhaps the philosopher could have been confident enough to shrug it off. He was a very well-known figure in the city, respected and criticised in more or less equal measure, so at the time the jokes at his expense may have been nothing more than amusement or mild irritation to him. However, there's the sting in the tail. Although his trial happened 20 years later, it's reported by Plato that Socrates accused the assembly of only knowing him through the play and not by his actual deeds. This may not be true, but even for Plato to say it happened suggests that the play was still well known years later. Despite all of the criticism and subsequent events, it seems that Aristophanes and Socrates were not only known to each other, but friends. You will remember the story from Plato about their meeting at the dinner party, where it seems nothing more than intellectual sparring was the order of the day. The defenders of Aristophanes, those who don't see any guilt for the death of Socrates lying at his door, argue that Socrates had become so popular that his beliefs and ideas were becoming widely distributed by pupils who misunderstood or misrepresented them, and that Socrates was a victim of his own success and the inability of his pupils to disseminate his ideas in a safe way. Young men without the talent for philosophy that Socrates had could well have ended up adding nothing but confusion to the intellectual life of the city, through ideas that lacked clarity or were just downright wrong and dangerous. We should also note that ridicule of Socrates was not confined to Aristophanes. One of the plays that defeated the clouds, Conus by Amepsius, also, we are told, lampooned the philosopher. Structurally, the play starts to move away from the norms of old comedy that had gone before. Comedy had maintained the tradition from tragedy of three actors and a chorus, but in the clouds, at the point where right and wrong enter, there must have been more than three actors on stage. Now, as this version was, we think, never performed, that might have been something to be smoothed out in rehearsals by introducing time for a costume change for one actor, for example, but it at least suggests that the confines of limited numbers of actors were being tested. Another change is that there is no exit to a party at the end, as there usually is in comedies. It's not clear why this became a feature of comedies, but maybe it was just a good way to get the audience out of the theatron and into the town in a mood for somewhere to have a drink and spend some money. The use of the chorus is both limited and unusual. Their opening lines seem to have been performed off stage. This potentially made them inaudible and, it's suggested, would have seemed strange to the audience who were more used to the chorus introducing the action. When it could be heard, the opening ode is more like the opening of a tragedy than a comedy. Eternal clouds, let us appear. Let us arise from the roaring depths of the ocean, our Father. Let us fly towards the lofty mountains, spread our damp wings over the forest-laden summits. There we will dominate the distant valleys, the harvest fed by the sacred earth, the murmur of the divine streams, and the resounding waves of the sea, which the unwearying orb lights up with its glinting beams. But let us shake off the rainy fogs, which hide our immortal beauty, and sweep the earth from afar with our gaze. This rather sombre piece comes as Strepsides is introduced into the thinkery, so we've already had the more obvious comedy of the opening scene and the banter between father and son and master and servant, followed by the initial satire of Socrates. Until now, the audience were probably feeling comfortable with this, laughing along with the old man struggling with his dissolute son and at the individual satire of Socrates and his ideas. But from this point, 
where Strepsides is introduced to the thinkery, we have a fellow citizen trying to use something that he's already said is humbug for his own ends and to get around his responsibilities. All of a sudden, this is a lot closer to home for the audience because Strepsides is a type of citizen rather than the very individualistic Socrates. And at least Socrates believes in what he's doing and has no obvious ulterior motive. The thrust of the satire shifts to Strepsides and therefore to Athenian society more generally. With the debate between right and wrong, the satire is then expanded even further as Aristophanes questions the apparent willingness of society to give up on the tried and tested methods of education and lifestyle that have in the past led Athens to greatness. Aristophanes has drawn his audience in and then left them with a big question about the direction in which their society is heading. And that gets even more serious when we get to the ending. Caught up by his own foolishness and corruptibility, Strepsides' reaction is violent. He destroys the thinkery. This is an unusual ending for a comedy. Usually by the end, the correct order is shown to be in place. In this traditional form, the play would have ended with reconciliation between father and son and punishment for those who had disrupted society. But here, we only have a destructive act and no resolution beyond it. Aristophanes leaves us with a bleak but prophetic view of the possible outcome of the new thinking taking hold. Athens did find Socrates too much in the end and lost most of their traditional values as they lost the Peloponnesian War and, in the end, lost their political independence as well. I think it's probably no longer possible for us to appreciate all the humour in the clouds. Not only is the play full of local references and personalities, some aspects of it were probably hard for contemporary foreigners to understand, but the subtleties of the relationships within Athenian society are no longer fully understood. However, it's still funny in parts. The obvious humour takes on subjects that still form the basis of comic conflict today, and there's a large element of bawdy, rude, visual, scatological and sexual jokes. Some of it may seem crude and silly, and comparing the impact of the jokes to the humour of something like a carry-on film, but with a bit more bite, is probably not too far from the mark. A good production that takes it on with plenty of vigour, visual gags and a good dose of slapstick comedy could, I think, still pull it off and create an enjoyable entertainment. There's certainly room for modern adaptation which could update the satire to current political figures and still retain some of the basic comedy that's very prevalent in the play. Next time, we leave the world of philosophy behind and see what joking Aristophanes can make over the courts and the legal system. Given his experience, the satire is heartfelt, and we will also take a look at how the legal system worked to better understand the details of the play. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.